All right. I think we're live <clears throat> on uh, both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, if you're I'm having problems with the audio on YouTube, I mean on Facebook. So if you're having problems with that, you might go over to my YouTube channel. It's YouTube slash Gabe Leonard Art. You should be able to find it there. Um, wasn't sure what I was going to paint today, so I asked for suggestions on my Facebook page, and one of the first people to respond, I can't remember her name right now, off the top of my head, she looked that up, but uh, she suggested the Lemmy from Motorhead, and I agreed. So that's what we're going to do today. I have to be honest, I'm not really knowledgeable about Motorhead's music, so I'm listening to it right now, and I have to say, I kind of like it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, and Lemmy has a face that I like to paint, so it's a win-win. Uh, thanks for everybody who suggested stuff. That was kind of a fun thing. Um, so I want to talk about a couple things really fast off the top here. Uh, so I'm only going to start with two colors, because I don't know what I'm going to do with the color palette on this one yet. So I'm going to start out with these uh, earth tone colors, raw umber and burnt umber. And uh, I want to give a couple of like little tips, like sometimes you get it on the last little bit of paint. Get yourself one of these tools. Uh, I have one that's made out of metal, it's a little bit better, but I can't find it right now. So, But you can use this, to, it's like it'll squeeze all the paint to the top. You just squish it in these little gears, and then you don't have any wasted paint in your tubes. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about um, is when I'm painting, I'm usually wearing a dark gray or a black shirt of some sort and that's because I don't want it reflecting into my painting so if you're wearing something that's light or white or a bright color like a red or something that's going to reflect in your colors and it's going to skew the way things look to you so those are the first two things so let's get this out of the way and uh, I think there was something else if I remember it I'll talk about it um, so, let's just get into it. I am listening to Motorhead, and it's kind of distracting, so I'm probably going to turn some of that off. Just give me one second, I can't talk and listen to this at the same time. probably paint with that, but painting, talking, and listening is a skill I have not practiced <laughs> up to this point. So I actually like often to paint without any music or any other sound going on other than the voice inside my head. Not that I like to hear what I have to say, but uh, I don't know. It's just kind of relaxing. You just listen to your own thoughts, and sometimes I just run off and do their own thing. And that's not always so bad. All right, so I'm just... I like mixing these two together. Um, I think raw umber is, is a nice, at least the brand that I use is a nice warm brown, or, I mean, or a cool brown, like a greenish, and, raw, and burnt umber is like a reddish warm brown. And I mix them together and I get more of a neutral neutral gray. I think the, the raw umber is probably the more grayer of the two if you mix, mix it with white. So I'm just getting this thin on my palette, just. You know, something that looks kind of like, um, I don't know, grease, <laughs> being oil paint. And I'm going to, I want it to just cover this canvas. And I'm not going to use a lot of paint because I don't want it to mix in with all the layers of color I'm going to put on top of it. But basically we're, like in the last couple of demos, just getting rid of this white. And the thinner you make it, the more it runs. And that could be good or bad, depending on what you want to do. If you like those runs and grips in your paintings, that's a good thing. But at this stage, what will happen is it'll run faster than you can paint. And you'll mark things in there, and it'll look good. And then you'll come back a minute later, and it'll all have melted away. Um, which, again, not necessarily a bad thing, but if that's not what you want, then it's not a good thing. So. so I got enough on here that's just kind of enough to barely run. Uh, 
on my YouTube stream, you can see all the reference I've looked through. Uh, this is just for the permit purposes of a practice of a painting. So, if I wanted to do a more thorough painting of Lemmy or somebody, what I might do is watch, especially for somebody like a musician, is watch a bunch of their videos and live performances um, and get a feeling for their movement and their gestures and the way they, their attitudes on stage and what they, their mannerisms. So when you're watching that, you're looking for those characteristics and then when you make the painting, you're trying to imbue that into the pose, into the facial expressions, more so than we are trying to just copy a photograph. So I have a whole bunch of photographs to choose from here, mainly because I, I have a very limited familiarity with Lemmy. I mean, I've, I've, I'm aware of him, and I've seen photos of him, but they're all sort of the typical everybody's seen it video photos, which for this purposes isn't necessarily that bad, bad of a deal. But the more you information you have, the more it helps you to solve problems when you're going through the portrait process and getting the lightness. So rather than trying to make sure you're copying the photograph right, you might want to understand the way his cheekbone looks or how his face actually works in three dimensions. And that might inform you on how to fix your drawing or the composition more than just trying to zero in on does it look like the photograph I'm using. <clears throat> so we want to use the photograph as a reference, not as some sort of dictation, which is difficult to do, and I'm guilty of being married to my reference too much, and it's something that I have to break away from, so at some point it's good to just set your reference to the side and work on your painting uh, without looking at anything, so that you're using some sort of your intuition, I guess. So... I'm going to kind of meld a few of these references together. So we'll get started. So I do this, I'm going to do the same thing I normally do. So I'm just going to wipe out the, um, oops, the background. Make sure your easel doesn't fall apart on you. So we want to just lay this drawing, this composition in quickly as possible. And uh, this can change as you move through the painting. You don't, so, you know, just to the point where we kind of work our drawing out for the painting because I'm having problems with this. There we go. <laughs> All right. So we work out the the, the composition, the drawing, because that is, if, without that, your no amount of painting is going to help you, really. So, you can keep refining that, um, pushing and exaggerating things as you see fit. I, I want to use bigger brushes. I, I mean, I'm just using this kind of laying a line work a little bit. Like, I often don't use that, but I, I kind of want to practice a little bit of um, drawing in with this too. I think that that's uh, one of the things I need to work on myself a bit more, is just the practice of drawing and sketching a lot more. I, I go right to p the painting process so fast that I often uh, would be better served to practice this just in sketchbook drawing. The better the better you get at drawing, the better your paintings are going to be, as uh, I, I think that painting is mainly an extension of drawing. So I'm going to exaggerate some of this a little bit. You know, we're just, you just want to do something that looks kind of fun. I want to show more of his hat. I'm going to bring this down like that. Let's see here. Okay, so... I'm just blocking in the shape of his face. got 
very distinct features. So painting somebody with these kind of features makes it easier because it gives you something to really to uh, jump on for um, light, you know, the lightness part of it. All right. So I don't. I think that's still too big. So I'm just gonna wipe that out. And all right. So let's do this. Let's just. Face like that. And then there's jaw right there. His nose. Alright, so under his nose and got his mustache, his handlebar. Mustache. So I have his face very um, wide. Don't know if I like that. So I'm gonna chop it. Like that. shadow under his lips, so I'm just laying in basic, uh, basic things here. I'm going to just continue to work his face up here. It's already looking horrible. <laughs> so, I am not really trying to show a technique or any way of, like, how to do a, how to paint or anything like that. So this is more of a I, the way I paint is more. Um, I don't know, I'm scared. It's a pro, well, I've labeled it as a process, and and uh, I like to leave lots of room to discover something like try to try to do something I haven't done before. Whether that's like, you know, it doesn't have to be like completely new, but like, it might be like last week where I was attempting to work with like different uh, a palette that re revolved around yellow and and purple, and I got into some Indian yellow. I I've used it before, and I really like that acidity. So I went to the art supply store and I bought like several different types of Indian yellow with several different several different manufacturers and the idea was to like see how they all work different and and they were all very unique and very different from each other um, some were brownish some were really golden yellow and and uh, I found that some of those worked better for what I wanted to do than others and um, I use that to finish the Tom Crean portrait from last week. Well, close to close to finish. I've been monkeying around on it for a while. Um, I didn't live stream any more of it. Um, it's funny. I do these as the idea is like I'm just going to do a simple portrait for fun, and then I end up spending like way more time than I anticipated on it because I can't help myself. Um, so I'm laying in all the dark shapes that I can here. Let's go in and 
So I, there's a couple of photos here of him playing the guitar and, with a hat on, and, and his whole face is in shadow, and then his shirt is uh, kind of lit up below him. And then there's a, some really good photos of him with sort of some light on his face, which I'm using for reference here. I'm going to try to meld those two things together a little bit. So rather than... Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of highlight the outside of his shirt right here. Like the light's falling on that, versus uh, versus uh, um, onto his face so much. I'm establishing these lights right here just so I have somewhere to lay the color in. But what I'm going to try to do is instead of um, doing this with a like a strong light, I'm going to change. I'm going to keep these temperatures. It's, it's going to be a lighter. In a darker area, but they're going to be cooler in color. So I might go into um, some blues here. I haven't quite decided the colors how that I want to do, so that's what part of this is as well. But right now, <clears throat> let's get the broad strokes down. So, all right. And when you're working from photo references, especially ones that you did not take yourself, um, start out by looking at them in very low resolution. Uh, I mean, I guess you don't have to, but that's what I do. <clears throat> and it keeps you from getting bogged down in too many details. Uh, so the, the one thing I'm working to achieve right here is just um, getting paint on the canvas and this right here allows me to do it in you know one tone it keeps things simple it makes it easier to focus on on this, this way I kind of like this lighter up here and darker down here I might play with something with that in a bit So, all right. I think now what I want to do is um, go, actually I'm going to get some blues. I'm going to get a I generally stay away from blues too. to use some cobalt blue, which you can see this is a good chance to monkey with this thing here. This tube's almost out. And don't want to be digging through that for 10 minutes while you're going to here. So I'm just going to squeeze a little bit out of this. And so I, I like to keep my blue colors on the left side of my palette. It doesn't really matter where you put them. I like to organize my colors in a way that just is, is uh, consistent, so I know where to look for colors on my palette. I'm not always trying to figure out where I put the blue or which blue is what. Like, so I'm going to use ultramarine blue, virtual ultramarine. Cobalt blue is a really like blue blue. It's like I don't know, Ikea blue. Uh, and I'm going to use Prussian blue, which is a very transparent and uh, very vibrant dark blue. So we'll put that in here. Okay, so now we have all, some dark tones. I'm going to also put my gray palette down. 
colors down, which um, are going to be Portland gray light, medium, and deep. Um, a lot, of, most of the time, I stick up, stay away from using white. I may amend that practice before too long. I think I want to, you know. I have my reasons for doing that, but uh, sometimes it's good to do what you don't do anyway. Um, mainly because you don't know what you're going to find out. <laughs> or you could find out something that might be useful and then you're like, why was I stupid? And you felt like I was being some sort of hero by not doing it the the way everybody else does it, or, you know, for whatever reason you set limitations on yourself. Um, I do think it's good to have <clears throat> some constraints, something to work within. It's where it allows you to think more creatively, so I, I like to use limited palettes for that reason. I'm also going to put <clears throat> a yellow ochre on here. Um, that's going I think actually I'm going to use a Naples yellow the Naples yellows I have are, I don't think they're true Naples yellow but it tends to um, work as a neutral like a gray like a warmish grayish color and I, I don't want to turn this green um, a raw sienna or actually a raw sienna or yellow ochre will work well with this blue as well. Okay. So here's a Ross here's a uh, raw sienna. And I'm going to put down a yellow ochre as well. Okay. See how the stream is going. All right. So I'm going to put in a background color. I'm going to get my big boy brush out. Or one of them. And this is a uh, house painting brush. You can get this at a hardware store like Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards if you're somewhere in Missouri. <laughs> Alright, so I have this basic color already mixed that I've been using for the background. I'm going to mix into that. Um, the reason I'm doing that is it this color ties all the other mixtures together, so even if you're off a little bit, that color kind of helps to unify everything. So you have at least one common thread, which would be your background tone. So let's start with a cobalt blue and see what happens. So as you can see, it's dark. This is really thick, so I'm going to just dip into my medium, which I didn't freshen up before the last year. Screw it. Actually, I kind of like that color, so I want to lighten this up. But instead of using white, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to use this yellow ochre. And that changes the tone to a little grayer, which I like, so I want to make that a little thicker. So let's get a little bit more paint in here. And then if I want to make it darker, I can tap back into these these earth tones here. Alright, so let's see that's still too too dark. Alright. So I'm gonna mix some Naples yellow into that. Lighten it up. I'm gonna blue it up a bit. I like that. That looks nice. Alright. So 
So I'm, when I'm doing this, I'm not mixing these strokes. I'm just sort of refining the shape. It's one color. And actually, if you have a few different variations of this color mix on your palette, then you can dip into it different ways and can create some different tones too. So let me go back to that. Mix some blue in there. Just smack it in there with one brush stroke. That's why I suggest using as big a brush as you can get away with. I'm really riding that edge right there. We'll see what happens. That might end up going off the frame of reference off the canvas here in a bit. I think that probably will make more sense compositionally once I get a little more into it. All right, let's chop that down. So we're just locking this in. Real simple like so that, that's actually gonna be smaller. Alright. So I think we're onto something there. I actually think that this color is going to look nice. Um, in the shadow area, and then I think that the color on his face, I'm going to use the same color, but a little warmer, and then there's going to be a big jump in color right here to make it look like there's a light shining out on his face, and then all this reflected light coming up in those cheekbones and stuff eventually. So I think that's the angle I'm going to take with that. So what I'm going to do, I actually want some green. And I like to use a color called Viridian Hue. You can use Viridian as well. Actually, I'll put them both in my palette and we'll figure out the difference between both of them. So Viridian Hue I know is transparent, so it will tint things nicely. But if you want to get like a really opaque mixture of that color, it isn't going to work well. It's going to look kind of blotchy. So you'll want to mix it with something that's more opaque, like a Payne's, a Payne's Gray or a, a Raw or Burnt Umber. And so this is straight up Viridian. You can see that, I think you can see that it's, uh, let me see if you can see it. Alright, so you can't see it. Alright, I'm going to move this so you can see it on the camera set. So that's Viridian Hue, and this is Viridian. This is a more opaque color. Um, I'm going to take a stab at both of them to see what works best for me here. So I sort of have, as if you've watched a few of these videos, I sort of have a method to the way I do these things, but um, I don't really have a technique that I follow precisely, you know, like every time, um, mainly because I feel like when you know what you're going to do all the time, it gets boring, I guess, is my complaint. Um, I like to, to not know exactly and leave room for some sort of discovery of something, something interesting that I might not have thought of to do on purpose. So as I start out, I'm just making some educated guesses. I mean, what I mean is like the, the education part of, I've done this enough times that I have a sort of idea of how I want to approach it, but and how it might work, but maybe not exactly. I'm just going to block in. I'm going to try to do right now is just get all this sort of really 
simple shaping and colors without going back and forth, blending anything. Um, almost graphic approach to this. And then we will go back into it with smaller brushes and more variation of color and refine things later. I find that is fun to do, so I'm guessing I'm going to do it. It's, who knows what's going to happen here. Um, I like these browns and greens, it wasn't really nice. So I'm going to keep that color. One of the crucial things about painting is making sure you have proper lighting in your studio. And it's one of the things I'm actually redoing right now. Um, I had, up to this point, I had had fixtures above my head. And um, I have a new easel on the way, which will allow me to do much larger paintings. And I don't want that fixture over my head. And plus, that fixture over, over your head, as closer you get to it, I have like nine foot ceiling right here. You have a hot spot on your, on your canvas up near the light. So what I want to do is not have that hot spot. And um, have, I want an even wash of light in my painting area. And I want to have enough light that I can see into these darker darks and know what I'm looking at. I also want to be able to see the color accurately. So on top of having the right amount of light, it's also important that you have the right temperature of light. And that would be a daylight balance, the light that's, and the, and the light temperatures are measured in degrees Kelvin. So on a bulb you'll see like 2800K or 5500K. What you want is something that's around 5000K, which is the natural daylight balance uh, for natural daylight. And uh, if you can find the color in rendering index, it'll say CRI, you want it as close to 100 as possible. Um, <clears throat> you also, like I was mentioning before, you don't want to wear bright clothing that will reflect. You don't want to have lights behind you or a really bright wall behind you or a TV right behind you that's re projecting light because you'll end up getting glare on your canvas. Um, I've rearranged my set, but I can already see there's glare, so I know that I'm going to have to put some flags on these lights. And I'll spunk that microphone. And a lot of the... Um, improvements I'm doing right now has actually been inspired by doing this live stream as I find that I need to improve the quality for that. I'm improving the way that it works. It's got to work two functions for me. It's got to balance for um, painting and for making the video look clean and clear. And, and so I'm trying to improve the functionality for both. So, alright, so I'm going to go into some of these flesh tones and I'm going to mix a color that I think will work using a mixture of these colors and I'm going to lighten it up a bit and use some of this shade. I was using yellow ochre. I think I'm going to go to this raw sienna. So this will warm up the temperature a bit so that it you know, it'll be more flesh-like. I'm just going to block that in. I'll lighten up a little bit. So again, I'm not blending and making the colors flow together seamlessly. It's more, I find it more interesting to have really simple shapes that read as, read correctly than it is to have lots of uh, rendered detail.
So I'm following the forms of his face with the direction of the brush stroke. I'm using a, a flat brush. You can see I got a lot of this paint mixture mixed in here. So what happens when you do this, see I have the dark paint, light paint, is that sometimes those things blend together as you're doing a stroke and you get these really can be infuriating if you're not expecting it, but it can be really good to create a variation of color in one stroke. Um, if you practice that, uh, you can do lots of fun things with that too. Alright, so I'm going to, this looks like it's a little bit darker a shade, so I'm going to mix a little bit of raw umber in there and come in and get this part of this fix over here. So what we're doing is creating a temperature change. So this is this. It's, it's a, well, it's a it's a value change as well, but it's also cooler. And what I might end up doing is making this all the same temperature and then make the value change a little more prominent. But for right now, let's sort of block this in. All right. Let's take this flesh color and just put it in his ear. One brush stroke. <laughs> <Do it. laughs> it's sort of a fun exercise to see how simple you can make your brush work. And uh, some of this takes some practice, so you have to just trust yourself that you're making the right decision and put something down and then go on to the next part. And you can come back to it later and adjust these things. Like I, I'm not trusting myself. I'm, I'm like, oh, I don't like that. And then I go, go back and I do exactly what I'm saying, don't do. But that's my, that's, that's what I do. And I don't listen to myself. Sometimes that pays off. Sometimes it don't. All right. Interesting. All right. So there's another big old ear over here to just indicate that in there. I like this brown tone in his beard, so I'm going to keep that going. I want to get some of this flesh tone he's got in his neck over here. Though. Let's see, so let's bring that down in there. Do, 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 do. So, all right. Ta da! <laughs> so now I will come in and make some other sort of various brush strokes to like define his nose. I'm going to skewer that face even more. So I'm going to pull some more of this cobalt blue. Mix in some of this uh, burnt umber. Ooh, I don't like that. So one of the things, one of the tricks that I try to get myself, I try to trick myself into is to um, eventually get to a point where I'm not 
trying, like I'm not trying to control it so much. It's just, you get into a state where things just happen, they happen correctly. Uh, and the, the way I describe that is that you have to learn how to see. And that's what basically I think painting is. It's learning how to see. It's not learning how to see the way somebody tells you. It's, to, it's learning how you see things. Um, and so when you're looking at someone's painting, you're looking at a, at a way that someone else looks at the world. Or a way that it can be looked at. And um, the ones that are able to express this well captivate us somehow, like some, you know, like the masters of painting. So you don't have to be a master of painting to paint, though. Um, and you don't have to learn a lot of techniques. Uh, what you have to learn to do is how to see and then figure out how to translate that into a, into a visual. And it's harder to it's harder to learn how to see things than it is to paint them, I think. And the only way you learn how to paint things is by doing it. So you have to you have to sit down and put time into doing it. And you if you go at it with an attitude of trying to achieve something great, like you're, you're like I'm going to I want to make great paintings. You can't be sitting around trying to make great paintings. Um, I know from firsthand experience that whenever I've done that, nobody really thought it was that great. And the thing that I did that people liked a lot, often I didn't think was that great. And so we don't get to decide what's great of our own work so much. That's really left up to other people. And uh, the thing that we can do is sit down and do it. And practice. So all the, all the painting I do is, for lack of a better term, is just a practice. Like I was joking myself the other day, like I don't think I've ever made a painting. All I've ever done is practice. Ta -da. Let's see it. All right. So let's keep painting in some of that mustache. Actually, I like those gray tones. Are nice. All right, that looks cool. Um, I haven't really pulled in any other blues yet. Maybe I shall. I got these greens out and I never even used them. Well, we'll be getting to that. Um, hmm. Let's see, what shall we do here? Let's, let's block in some tones here. Actually, I'm going to pull in this Prussian blue. Russian blue. I like it. I like how saturated it is. I'm going to work that into the rest of this. That actually looks really nice. I like it. Really cools that temperature down, but it's saturated, so it looks vibrant. Next to the gray background. All right. So let's continue to pull with that. So okay. All right. Fresh and blue is our friend. Not really. 
see I gotta see they gotta come way in or it's gotta go out the frame of reference, so let's bring it in a little bit more. Bring some more of this Prussian blue. I'm gonna mix some of this burnt umber so this burnt umber is a little warm. That looks pretty nice. Let's see. I'm actually going to change this background. Now, so I'm gonna to continue to refine the shape. With um, the shape of his head with this background color, so I'm gonna keep on doing that. shape of his face right here. I'm just going to kind of lay that in there. Uh, just going to darken it nice and don't blend, but I just want to make that all one thing. Alright. So I'm going to come back in with this Prussian blue mixture. So I just continue to sort of draw this out. Um, do that. There we go. That's going to be a Hmm. No, sir, I don't like it. Oops, that's not what I want to do. No, that's not what, I, not what I wanted to do either. Alright. So, I'm going to go back to the cobalt blue and some burnt tumber. There we go, that looks kind of nice. Alright, so we want the shape, to, like, the silhouette should read as a shape of how it flows on, onto the painting. And, uh, so I'm going to carry this shape Cross farther over here. Mm. Use this background. I'm running out of background color here. So remember, I mixed cobalt blue, uh, yellow ochre, and that looks pretty close. I think I was a little bit medium or deep paints gray.
right? So I feel like his face is too big or his hat's too small. Um, I'm not sure which direction I want to take this right now. So let's exaggerate his hat a little bit more. I like his face. So I'm going to go back into this Prussian blue. I'm going to trust up Durham. Let's look at this Ross and the Hemlock. Just keep working on that. I like white lighting this up, it looks kind of nice. They make this sort of blue. Mm -hmm. Make it almost like a landscape painting in fog or something. Like Strokes under his chin. All right, so keep moving this direction. I think I'm starting to find it here. Now, if you get to this point and this. You're not happy with the composition, like you want this to be perfectly centered. Uh, wipe it out and start over again. I mean, the only thing we've lost to this point would be whatever precious time we think that we've invested into it. But if you're not happy with the way something is turning out, you can always change things. But that being said, Don't be too quick to second guess yourself. I mean, there's been times on paintings where I've, near, you know, that I have started over and turned into something much greater. There's been times where I was about to start over and I decided that eh, I was move on to something else for a while, and I come back and it turns out that what I was doing was actually working. It was just a couple of things off of it. And then there's been paintings where I hated it, wanted to start over, almost did, and then. By the time I finished, I'm like, oh, this turned out really great. So sometimes it's just a matter of sticking with it. But the trick is to recognize when something is salvageable and when you're just better off throwing it in the trash bin or painting over it or doing something else with it. If it's going to be too much of a hassle to rework it, if it's like a major compositional problem that, or whatever it might be, um, paint over it. Let's 
that's what I would do. Yeah, that's what I have done. I, I never really know how these are supposed to turn out. And so I often get to a point on a lot of my paintings where I'm like, <laughs> just kind of shake my head. Like, I don't know, this is a stupid idea, this is not going to work. And then it turns out working just fine for whatever reason. Like, I don't know. I don't know how I do some of this stuff. I mean, I, I know how I did it, but I don't, it's hard to explain. So if there's some questions that anybody has about technical stuff, and uh, feel free to leave comments. I'll try to get to most of them. Try to get to them. Uh, if I don't get to them, I can responding in, a, in responding in the comment section. I will try to take that into account when I do these streams going forward too. All right, so I want to like, I kind of like the way that's looking. I want to um, kind of attack this area here now. I'm going to pull that Prussian blue mixture. I'm going to pull some of this raw umber. I'm going to light. Uh, I'm going to go to some of these shadow areas of his face that are like the sh those stuff that's in the light. I'm going to hit that with more vibrant or saturated blue color. I'm using this ultramarine blue. I'm going to lighten it up with some of this Portland gray light. See what that does. Should get like an icy cold. That's too much. Actually, check that out. Go on to it for a little bit darker tone. Like I'm going to hit the highlights with this. Blue. See what that does. So if I just don't like that. I'm gonna grade up a little bit. Yeah, that no sir, I don't like that either. So I'm just gonna wipe that off. I like that. So I want a grayer tone of this color I use for a flush tone. Looks pretty cool. Like that, like that. I'm going to light that up a little bit more. I'm going to use a little bit of this maple's yellow. a little bit more of it. Okay, so I'm mixing this people's yellow, so giving this nice sort of uh, foamy blue-green color. It's really nice. I like it. Starting 
become alive a little bit. I like it. So I don't want to. So I don't want to. What happens is you put the same color all across your painting, as it'll start flattening out. So when I put that there, it draws too much attention to itself. So I'm going to bring it back a bit. All right. Then I'm going to accentuate this right here. That looks cool. All right. I'm going to um. Yeah, I'm going to hit his lips and the tops of his chin. So we're describing the structure, like a three-dimensional structure, the way the light's hitting this. And I'm doing this from the top down, although I have these other references of fill light doing different things. So we'll stick with this. Turns out I'm using kind of the colors from some of these other references and then to this one paint, one, one reference that I have. slightly different color over here. So what I'm doing is I've laid in the hottest part on that chin and rather than using that same color over here I know that that turns in space so that's reflecting some different light and it's a little little darker maybe a little cooler as it's going away from us just a tad so that's different strokes. So every time I'm putting strokes on here, or pretty close to every time I'm modulating the color, as you see I have this sort of gradation here and I'm picking one into the other, getting an approximation, I'm not spending a whole lot of time trying to overthink it. Um, you, you see me dabbing back and changing and, and, and reworking. Ideally when you get kind of into flow you don't, you, you stop away, you step, stop doing that. You just start blocking it in. And if it's not if it's not correct, you just come back at it later. So I'm describing his chin, the structure, the way it's shaped. He's got this dimple in his chin. I'm going to put this darker. I'm going to pull a little bit more of a more saturated color, which is like this Prussian blue mixture I have. Um, it might tend to jump forward in space a little bit visually. Um, there's a few things to think about when you're trying to create a sense of depth in something. And so I often approach uh, landscape painting, you know, portrait painting as a landscape, or any sort of figurative painting as landscape paintings. And sometimes when I meet people and they ask me what I do and I tell them I'm an artist, like, oh, you know, like, my aunt's an artist, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's great. And they're like, oh, what do you do? Like paintings, and they're like, oh, what kind of paintings? I just tell them landscape paintings. So if I try to describe what I do, then I just, I can't, it's like I paint people doing things, or, you know, <laughs> I don't, it's like I don't know how to describe it. Um, so, but the, to back to the point, um, the principles of creating a sense of space and depth, they have, the things that you learn through landscape painting, they also apply to figurative painting um, and creating the illusion of space. So the way that that basic principle works is how things are related to each other. So 
the, in this sense, the things that are grayer or, and lighter are probably going to go, like, this looks like it's behind his hat because that hat is darker and that pulls forward. So you're going to have a relationships between dark and light. You're going to have relationships between warm and cool. So I have the warm tones of the brown and the cool tones of the blue. And as I start organizing those better, they will help describe and make things push and pull back into space. And so you have you have the light and dark, you have the temperature, and then you have the hue, which is the particular color. Like a, if I put a red dot in his eye right here, that would just jump out. Like actually, I'll show you what I mean. Let me grab uh, a red color. And this might be something I keep in the painting, but I'll probably paint it out for now as a detail. But I, I kind of want to demonstrate what I'm talking about here. All right. And then shortly I'm going to stop for the day because I have other things I have to go do. And I wanted to at least do this for an hour. Um, okay, so I'm going to use some cadmium red light, but I'm going to not use it straight out of the tube. I'm just going to mix it in with this blue color. The cadmium red is like kind of a complementary color. But if I take that and I put that right there, and I do something weird like that, that jumps and draws your attention. It becomes something very dominant because it's the only thing like that in the painting. And it is... Um, it, it, so something very small becomes a dominant part of the painting. Um, so that's an example. And that jumps forward at you. I'm going to color that in real quick. Just because I don't want anything else left on the canvas before we're done. The whole goal is within an hour or so to have something kind of on its way. Like You, you can kind of tell what's going on. You got the whole canvas covered. You got a painting going on. Um, I might want to actually let me take some of this green that I put on here and didn't do anything with. Mix some of this yellow ochre. Grab some of that raw umber. Warm this background up. I want to separate the background a little bit from the, the character. Everything's really too even right now. So I might do something a little more extreme like that. Actuality, the more gray we go right here, the more the colors in this part of the painting are going to look like color. So the colors will jump forward, the saturated part will fall back into space. Something along those lines. Alright, so this is also a fun thing to if you're wanting to do some sort of like, I, I like to do something that might ruin a painting, or not really ruin a painting, but like, I don't have complete control over. So I'm going to do that. So let's mix some Prussian blue, let's mix some raw umber.
just play around. Often this doesn't do much of any good, <laughs> but it's fun to play around with. It's not going to be too hard to just start doing stuff like that with it. That looks pretty, pretty gnarly. I'm going to thicken up this. Keep in mind that when you're using the paint thinners to do this, that paint thinners break down your pigment. So it's going to destroy the paint. Um, the, the structure. Like the, so if, you don't, if you're nervous about that, maybe you want to stay away from that. I don't know, but I just thought I would give you that little bit of a caution before you start running mineral spirits and thinners all over your painting. Just keep in mind that it's not like Alright guys, so I'm going to stop right there for right now. I will continue to work on this painting. I will post it on my social media at some point during the week. I actually might, I like the Motorhead music, I started listening to it today. I might listen to some more of it, but I might actually do a painting of this guy, like more involved in a pot, you know, posing his guitar, like playing his guitar, like doing something. Um, so this is good practice. Even if you only do this, like one hour, this is an hour and 15 minutes, uh, once a week, as just practice of painting, um, not really worrying about if it's going to turn into something great. Um, at least you'll have one painting a week, and out of that, eventually, a few of those will turn out really freaking cool. Um, some of them will be complete turds, but that's, that's the nature of life. Alright guys, so I'm going to stop. I will check in with you on the comment section and etc.